So this is the prototyping flow, right? Yeah, we can give a link to the prototype which is created inside Figma to the engineers. Usually I combine it with two things. One, I could record a Loom video of me walking through that prototype and playing with the prototype and also explaining what is happening over here. And then I also just drop the link of the prototype itself. So when either the product manager or the engineer, whoever is looking at it, they would have both of them. They would also get a way to act, interact with the prototype themselves. And then they come up with a lot of detailed feedback when it do that because you're feeling things. It, it looks like almost as good as it's implemented. So that gives you more feedback, which you cannot see when you're just uh, doing the static mock. Hey folks, welcome to sneak peek dot design where you get an in-depth look into the Figma files for the top designers. In this episode, we have Darshan, who is going to give an in-depth look into the Figma file for Highgraph. Thanks a lot for having me, Janil. Quick question for you. Whenever you hit a creative roadblock, what is the one thing you do to get out of it? After spending a lot of time thinking about dwelling on the problem, I just go for a walk. Taking a walk always helps. And I've never come back from a walk thinking that this was a waste of time. And is there any particular time you take these design walks? I usually prefer to take these walks when I can still see the daylight. And unfortunately, I live in Berlin. That's not unfortunate, but the weather is unfortunate. That uh, we don't have enough days where we have the sunlight, but I can still have the daylight. And I prefer to take the walks during that time. Got it. How would you explain Highgraph Studio in layman terms? Highgraph Studio is the new version of our application, Highgraph. And Highgraph is a headless CMS. A lot of companies which have content operations at scale, they try to use Highgraph to run their operations smoothly. You can think of it like a design system, but for your content. You can put all your content in that one system. And then whenever you want to use it, wherever you want to use it, you make API calls. So the content is still the same. And when I say content, it's mostly the metadata, like the name of the movie. How do you organize your Figma file? So if we look into the basics, there's a structure here in the Figma file. So we have created these different pages. Our first page is dedicated to cover. We don't really make many changes here in the cover. Cover essentially is like a snapshot of the file. So by looking at this, you should be able to tell what the file is about. So this is about the content table 2.0, the second version. In the timeline over here, it will give you an idea when we started working on the project and when it's shipped, when it's live, when people can use it. That's when we put the final date to it. As you can see that this is not clearly updated here, but I will when it's fully live. And the status over here gives you an idea into what stage of the process this uh, particular feature or the file is. And the avatars that you see over here are the people uh, that are working on it. So usually you would see the faces of product managers and product designers here. Sometimes when the engineers get involved and they're also contributing to it, then you also see their faces. Then we have the research page over here. The research page, it's not very structured. We put all of the information related to that project when we are still trying to understand what the problem is, not getting into the solutioning part yet. We would also usually put like links to our shaping document for every feature that we work on. We have a shaping file inside Notion and there could be more screenshots. This file did not have a lot of things on the research tab, but it had a lot of things in the scratch pad. And Scratchpad is this page, you can think of it like a canvas for the artist. Things here, they take a lot of different shapes and forms. This is where all the magic or all the madness happens. And by the nature of it, this page is not structured. If I were to show this page to someone who is not working on this feature on a day-to-day -day basis, they would go nuts. And if I also enable the commenting thing over here, you would see that there are like a lot of comments also left on each of these pages. UI page, when we have finalized on designs and we want to make it into the final version, which is then going to be coded, that is when we move things to the UI page. This page over here, you can also see that we use this emojis and now Figma also has a way to mark it ready for development. 
So here you would see all the final versions and this is like the source of truth for any feature. So before the feature gets implemented in code and you can see it in the application, you can always come to this page and this is how you would see that it's going to look like in the final stage when it's implemented. And the developers, they use this page a lot. They use the dev mode. So we mark things ready for development here. They would go into dev mode, start inspecting things. A lot of comments that you see on this page also come from developers because when they are implementing the feature, they would have a lot of questions. And when we once start implementing, uh, sometimes we are comparing the feature, uh, seeing if it's matching to the Figma files or not. We would put screenshots over here. It's not necessary that we would have those screenshots every time. The process sometimes changes. Sometimes we have calls. Sometimes we have like dedicated QA sessions. In that case, we might also just present it over there. We might record a loom. But in a nutshell, this is how the structure of our Figma file looks like. I love it. Very structured approach, Darshan. What does the before and after look like? What was the design before? And then what does the design look like now? We have a classic app still going on. People who are still in classic, they get to see this. So this is the before or current, how the content table looks like. And here in Figma, you see the new version of it. Definitely looks more cleaner. States. That was one of our major motivations. We wanted to make things look cleaner and modern. I'm embarrassed to say that uh, when you look at this content table over here, it has so many things that any good designer, when they look at it, they would spot a lot of basic issues with the UI. And that's because this was made by the engineers. They did a great job in the beginning. And we had this for a long time, which is a testament to their thinking as well. But engineers had developed this uh, design. It was never designed. And then we came up with a new design version. I think in the newer design, I feel like getting information at a glance is very easy compared to the old version. That's one big difference that I see right away. Yeah, I'm glad that you can uh, see that right away. <laughs> Because we are a content heavy application. Here you just see like a small snapshot of what the table could look like. But it gets very crazy for projects that have a lot of data. I'll just give you an example. So here, when we were creating all the states of how things are going to look inside the content table, we created like this one big version where we could have all the fields. So what you were seeing over there only had four or five fields. But here you can see that content table can actually get this big and we have all kinds of different fields from slug, ID, single line text to this options with list and hovers, numbers, float, boolean, uh, date. I can just keep on scrolling and you can see that this will go on and on. So our content table is not just a tiny table with four or five fields. It is huge. So what I'm hearing is that you design for the edge case, which can have everything in there and then try to make a design that's scalable for that. Yeah, we call this stress testing. So initially, when I was designing this content table, that was not the thought that I would just put everything and see how it works. But I wanted to get the feel for it. So at that time, I would look at the most frequent use case. So most of the times, people who don't have large projects like large enterprises, they would have something like this. And this already looks like it has a lot of data. So it's not like it's very tiny. But you can expect that a usual content table could look like this. So I try to start designing from there. And then once we get the feel for it, once we see how things are flowing, then we can start designing for all the edge cases. But if we just jump into those edge cases immediately, then you can imagine like we would never get to the uh, end of the tunnel. Makes sense. What's your favorite feature that you designed for this? Maybe you can walk us through uh, your top process behind why you designed it like that. This as a whole is, uh, it's like a whole new content table and uh, you get the experience that you're using something new. It gets you to where you want very quickly. So it's like a whole thing, very difficult to, put a finger on a tiny details, but I, I can show you some visual details. So here we have this new way of multi-select and new way of doing the bulk operation. So if I show you the old version, you can see that we had this options up here on top and you can already see that we have some color coding over here. So it helps uh, people get the job done. But of course, it doesn't give you that clean look and feel. And then also sometimes it's hard to differentiate which one is a button, which one is information. So here it says three items selected. That is actually just an information. And here, clear selection, this option over here, 
yeah, they are buttons, but of course we cannot just put like solid buttons, right? Otherwise it would just be too overwhelming. So in order to create something, which was like not getting too much in the way, but also looking cleaner, we came up with this new version where we have like this floating bar of selection. So you can see that as soon as you select something over here, it gives you this bar. So here you have the tab or the toggle to show the selected items and then you have the buttons. And we tried a lot of different versions of how we wanted to create this. Uh, it's not that easy. So ultimately, we went with this cleaner version. But if I go in the scratch pad over here, we were trying a lot of different things. It was also important that we, we still wanted to communicate the message that you are taking an action, like edit is more like a neutral action, publish, green action, unpublish, like a warning color for that. Then delete is like the red action. So we were seeing if we can still keep that ethos together where these colors would still communicate that meaning. So we created this version with it. But, and you can see that this is like a dark mode on the light mode. So it creates like a clear distinction. Then we also created like a lighter mode so that it doesn't get too much in the way. And then we also tried this one, which is more like a subtle version, but still creates a distinction between the buttons here and the whole floating bar. But then ultimately we settle on this because we realized that these actions, they don't need to be too much in the face. And also people build the muscle memory over the period of time. We are yet to get feedback. We have to see uh, whether people find this more useful than what we had before or the color coding that we had before was useful. A lot of people that use these products, they are engineers, designers. They are people who are used to use modern applications which are very well designed and which are very subtle they don't get in your way so the idea is that we might not need to make things uh, so intrusive or so bold so we are trying to go with that ethos and you can see that it would show in the whole design when you see the content table as a whole you would see that we have gone for this progressive approach where we don't throw everything at you in the default view we try to give you a lot of the information when you start interacting with it so we have the hover states and more details like that i'll show you that here in the default view it looks much cleaner because it doesn't have that edit icon or the checkbox it only appears when you are showing an intent when you're hovering on it then it gives you this option so it, it separates it out and helps the application grow as you start interacting with it if you get what i mean I do. A whole content table has tiny details like this. Especially in that iteration that you discarded where you had the action bar with so many different colors. I felt like those colors for the buttons were also competing with the color tags that you have for the content in the background. It was just too much color going on. Yeah, that's right. And we also tried to make those colors subtle as well. Originally, they were using much more darker shade of this green and yellows. We tried to make sure that it passes the accessibility test. So the text can still be readable, but the color themselves, we tried to mute them. It's so amazing to see how other designers are organizing their Figma files, how they're approaching design because i'm like i should take i should steal that idea from darshan's playbook this is what i should also do to my figma files yeah it's always very interesting to see how people get about their work and you don't see this kind of details in uh, videos or conversations you just see the final version and that's about it right? and this kind of information is hard to come by so i'm glad that you are forcing me to do this thank you uh, this file has gotten so massive that sometimes i find it very hard to go to the frames that I want to. Let's take a look at your design system. I'm curious to take a sneak peek into that. So our design system is called Baukasten. It's a German word and it literally means a construction kit because German is a very literal language. We just picked up this word. We are going through a revamp of our design system. So there's a lot of things which are not fully implemented and we have also not published it publicly. The team is called Baukasten and we have the project called Baukasten inside that. And then we have different files dedicated to components, foundation. So in the components, you would see a structure like this where we have the base components or the main components, if you want to call it that way. And then all the different variants. One thing that we have started to do recently which i am a big fan of is that we have started to give examples of how something can be 
used. So let me just try to find it. And this files over the period of time, it, it gets so huge. You can already see like there are so many pages over here. It's all well structured, but the product designers, they don't usually have to come to this files because they would just be inside designing a file and there they would just be interacting with the picker dialogue inside Figma. And here, this is the example that I was referring to. We have more examples like this, where we also just try to show it like how a combination of this component would look like. And then we also started to create blocks where I think we, have, we do that for empty states in particular where you don't need to create like the whole big component with all of the smaller atoms. It's like a big molecule. So this one blocks. It just gives you like a kickstart. It's just a combination of different components. Here, yeah, this is a navigation bar. So here you can see we created like the small components of all of our navigation bar elements. And with that, we created the navigation bar. And then we also converted that into a component so that when we want to use it inside the Figma file, we can just drop like the one big component and then we have all of this variants where we have settings, content, assets, schema, application is quite picked that way. And then we also try to give an example of how it looks like uh, when you use the whole component. I can definitely see that by using these molecules that you've designed, like the navigation, the title bar, I can quickly just create a prototype of what I want to communicate. Yeah. And this is actually a great example of how these blocks are useful. So this is an empty state block. We often find ourselves in a spot where we have to create an empty state for whatever new page feature that we would be creating. And it's a lot of work to create like a block for illustration and then use the typography styles and then the buttons. In theory, you can do it with all of the components, but because the structure doesn't usually change, there could be some changes. In that case, we'll detach the component and make those changes, but a lot of times it doesn't change. So then we just get that block, drop it in the file, and then voila, we have the empty state. Oh, I see. And then the empty state is prompting the user to take some action. Yeah, exactly. We try to make it educational. Uh, so it would oftentimes, it would have the button. So the action that we are prompting, uh, we do also have links to the documentation. Our product is quite technical and engineers, when they use products like this, they don't really prefer to talk to people or talk to support. They would rather just find uh, the information themselves. So in a lot of these places, we also drop links for our documentation. So instead of using just illustrations, which is very common in consumer apps, what you're doing is you're combining tutorial type information along with some nice illustrations and using that as the basis for designing the empty states. I love that. Yeah, that's right. So this is the prototyping flow, right? Yeah, we can give a link to the prototype, which is created inside Figma to the engineers. Usually I combine it with two things. One, I could record a Loom video of me walking through that prototype and playing with the prototype and also explaining what is happening over here. And then I also just drop the link of the prototype itself. So when either the product manager or the engineer, whoever is looking at it, they would have both of them. They would also get a way to interact with the prototype themselves. And then they come up with a lot of detailed feedback when it do that because you are feeling things. It, it looks like almost as good as it's implemented. So that gives you more feedback, which you cannot see when you're just uh, doing the static mock. Darshan, thank you so much for giving us an in-depth look into Highgraph's Figma file. Appreciate it. I'm glad you found it useful and the people that uh, end up watching this video also find it useful. Hey, this is Jay. It means the world to me that you watch this video. If you want to unlock the AI design and growth design interviews with designers at some of the top companies in the world, then head on over to sneakpeek.design and subscribe to the newsletter.